today, I'd like to uh, introduce our artist and lecturer and educator tonight, Kathleen Turner. Kathleen, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, my, my art career has been, as he said, rather uh, uh, circuitous. It's, I always sort of liken it to um, kind of following your, the thread of Ariadne in the maze of the Minotaur. And uh, Maria Montessori talks about the inner teacher and how the inner teacher guides you where you're meant to be sort of in spite of yourself. And so I, I sort of consider this my journey. Um, finding our artistic voice is really never easy or straightforward, but somehow we have to trust that it's in there somewhere. Uh, a 2019 trip to Norway to meet uh, cousins that I had co been corresponding with for about 10 years uh, revealed to me um, my ancestors as artists, musicians, ministers, woodworkers, teachers, and it re resolved all kind of a lot of questions I had about, I have all these different interests and I love to do each of these things just that I just described uh, with, with passion, but it's, it feels so scattered. And so I went to Norway and my cousin Ingrid said, well, you know, th these are the people that you came from. I suddenly felt much more relaxed about, about that. And so uh, doing a little bit of ge genealogy, which is another one of my pastimes, uh, has resolved a lot of my creative angst. Uh, my, my Norwegian forebears lived on the land and they had an intimate relationship with it. This is Ingrid and her husband's home. It's a, a historic property and the equivalent of the uh, Norwegian uh, National Register of Historic uh, Places. It's about 400 years old and many of these buildings are original. Uh, the house that, they're live in, that they built to live in after when they had, they're raising their family had to be built in the exact style as the historic buildings from the 16, the 15 and the 1600s. Um, I'm a city girl. I grew up in Rogers Park on the north side of Chicago. I went swimming in the lake and I had no idea of any of this um, until, in fact, I went to I went to Norway. But I was just like this really ordinary kid who loved to draw. I drew in my baby album. Um, I drew pictures of horses and um, mostly horses, horses in pajamas, mm -hmm. and um, more horses until I got to about nine or ten, and I realized you're not supposed to draw in your baby album. Oh, um, and, but, but I know now that from, from the time I was two or three years old, I loved to draw, but what was I going to do with that? Okay. Um, so one of the things I always wanted to learn to draw was trees, but trees are very daunting. There's so much information and I wanted to draw them very realistically. I became very discouraged. Um, when I, I, even though my father was a mechanical designer and an artist, um, I am very proud of me and my, my ability to draw. They didn't, weren't able to like really give me any, what I considered good guidance on, on how to draw, how to draw what I saw. And the big problem was that I didn't know how to really see yet. So the, one of the challenges of being an artist is to be able to see what you're seeing and be able to communicate what you're seeing to your audience, your artistic audience, you know, communicate on your piece of paper or your canvas or your poem or your music. And that is something that I think all artists have to find their own way in. 
I, I remember when I was in, uh, just starting high school, the high school counselor asked me why I wanted to take four years of art and three years of science, and uh, why didn't I want to take home ec and typing? And um, my, mother, my, my mother had an office job. She was a um, um, medical secretary, and my, my father was a mechanical designer. I wanted to take drafting. Oh, no, you're a girl, you can't take drafting. I said, well, can I take woodshop? Oh, no, you're a girl, you can't take woodshop. I wasn't too happy about that. But then the, the high school counselor says, well, I said, well, what about, you know, can I take, you know, I'd like to take science. Well, why do you want to take three years of science? You're not college material. And this was in spite of having top um, achievement test scores and, and good grades throughout the first, the first eight years. And that kind of, I don't know, I, it, it really discouraged me. And so I did, you know, I went through high school, I took the classes, I passed my classes. And then when I got out of high school, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. And so I did what my mom did, was go get an office job, which was like one of the most soul killing things there is if you're an artist. But I dealt with it because, you know, I'm an adult. Um, But once I was out of high school, I found an obsession with ancient Egypt. And I was lucky enough to take classes with Dave, Dr. David Silverman, who was project Egyptologist for the treasures of Tutankhamen, the first one at the Field Museum. This was in, I think, 1974 or so. And so I studied Egyptian hieroglyphics with him in the evening extension at the University of Chicago, two, two sessions, and then I became a docent for the Field Museum. And this was just amazing. So I did a whole series of these uh, fabric tapestries in kind of an artistic response to this. And that was, that, you know, took up a number of, a number of years of my, of my creative output. Not long after that, um, I was uh, sort of in a, a sort of a, a little bit of a life crisis because I didn't really like my my day job. I worked in an office. I knew I was I knew I needed to make art, but I didn't know what it was that I was going to do. And my job, my day job, really only afforded me enough to live and not pay for art supplies or any of these other things that, you know, are sort of part and parcel of being, being an, you know, a practicing artist. And just, but I, I had just enough extra that I could take some dance classes at Ruth Page. I thought, oh, well, this will be a good antidote to this really sedentary job that I had. So I took an, art, an art, a dance class at the Ruth Page School of Ballet because it was just two blocks from where I lived. And I, I realized that wasn't it going to be it for me at all. I just was not, I have not, not a single kinesthetic bone in my body. But on the way back, I walked past this building that's the Pell and Chisel Academy of Fine Arts at 1012 North Dearborn in Chicago. And something just like kind of reached into me and sort of pulled me up those stairs and maybe ring the doorbell. And then I waited and I waited. And this kind of wizened old man comes, opens the door and he looks at me with kind of this wondering look at his face. And he says, can I help you? And I said, uh, do you teach classes here? And he kind of cocks his head and looks at me and smiles a little bit. And he says, yes, we do. I like your beret. Would you come next Saturday and, and pose for our, for our portrait study? Clothed, of course. And so that started um, a number of years of study at the, the Pell and Chisel Academy of Fine Arts. Long story short, um, I ended up on the board. And then another, another story is the, uh, it was while I was on the board, the, the, somebody in the previous administration 
had just sort of forgotten to file a $5 certificate that secured their property tax exemption. And it was also time for them for there to be new board elections and nobody wanted the pallet and chisel to fall fall down on their watch. So they looked all around at each other and they said, Kathy, how would you like to be head of the nominating committee? And I was like, uh, no. And then they said, uh, and then the nominating committee looked at each other and they, they, they said, Kathy, how would you like to be president of the Pellet and Chisel Academy of Fine Arts? And I said, no. And, but I got outvoted. So I, I went up that uh, December and I went up in front of them and Ross Rohr, one of our more interesting members stood up and she says, she's a woman. She's not qualified to be president. Ne neither one of those things I could really argue with. Um, and, and, and yet there I, there I was. And that, so here's a, here's a, this, this, these are serious, very serious artists here in the advance. So here I am a uh, number of years later, the woman in the portrait there is Diana Ferran. Well, she had been president of the Pallet and Chisel two years before me. So I, Ross knew that, you know, Diana had been president. I don't know where, where he was going with that. But needless to say, although we had uh, some, we had an assistant attorney general and lawyers from the creative arts and our own corporate counsel all say, uh, we don't know how to how to fix this. Sorry, one of my one of my friends, uh, Cynthia Bowman from church, um, who worked for Jenner and Block, which is a really prestigious law law firm in Chicago and elsewhere, um, saw me at church and she said, oh, "Kathy, how are you doing?" And then the whole story came out, and she said, "I'll put my paralegal on it." And so the Palinchisel is still standing today. And they are still offering classes, and it's an amazing place. And I'm very proud to have had a role in in its uh, in its continuance. And I'll just kind of leave it there. Well, a few years later, um, I de I developed uh, an interest in in botanical art. Uh, I became a commercial artist while I was, uh, I actually moved into a, an apartment in the coach house at the, the, behind the pail and chisel. And I, and I started painting uh, both figurative studies, but also, but also plants. Um, I uh, studied at the American Academy and I was accepted as an artist member of the pail and chisel and um, then I began an undergrad, began my undergraduate uh, program at DePaul University, and this sort of flies in the face of the high school counselor who said, uh, "You're not college material." But I, I was really anxious, you know, kind of insecure about that because you know people saying, "Oh, you can't do this, you can't do that." I mean, these are these are pretty loud voices in your ear if you hear them long enough, right? Uh, After I finished a graduate degree in, uh, in, in theology at Loyola University, um, when my son was a teen, I again kind of felt the pull of art. And uh, I noticed that there was a scientific and botanical art program at Morton Arboretum. And so maybe now I can finally learn how to draw trees. Um, in Illinois, children under 14 are um, required by law to be supervised constantly. And I was a single mom at the time. And uh, doing the math, it was actually cheaper for me to bring him to class with me than to hire a, a babysitter. Um, so we, we uh, became art buddies. His mother, his, his uh, paternal, his paternal grandmother and, and an aunt um, 
are all were also are also uh, commercial artists. But when it came to watercolor, I was talking to my son and I said, "Well, um, you want to take this watercolor class with me?" And the, and I'm also like figuring out how much this is all going to cost, and it's going to be fine. But he he said he said uh, to me, "Mom." I know how much you really enjoy these classes. I want you to go ahead and take these classes and burn down the house. And he didn't. So, but I also made sure that he had, you know, he was he was well taken care of. My, uh, one of my friends took him to Awanas those evenings or, you know, I had had him either play dates with friends or I hired I hired a sitter because it it became clear to me that this was something that I I, I really needed to do. So there's this is a, a painting that was done of my son when he was about six years old, Harms Woods by his uh, his paternal grandmother Ruthie L. Halliday. So a year or so earlier, Fred Case's book, Orchids of the Western Great Lakes Region, kind of jumped into my arms at Borders Bookstore in Oak Park. I don't know if that ever happens to you that a book just sort of just, you know, just jumps into your hands, but it happens to me once in a while. And I thought, wow, there's orchids in Chicago. And the next question was, well, how are they doing now? This, or this book was about 20 years old at the time. And so my son was in Boy Scouts and he was working on a conservation badge. So we drove up to Volabog in Illinois Beach State Park where we saw orchids, native orchids in bloom. It was pretty spectacular. But the next morning he and I were shopping, the next summer Ian and I were shopping for hiking boats for his Philmont trip, uh, which was a 50 miler. So at REI, I noticed a booth for Audubon and I talked the young man there into, uh, uh, giving me some information about orchids, and he he said, "Well, I don't know who um, who would know unless it was Suzanne Macy, who works for the Chicago Botanic Garden." So the next the next day, I was on the phone with her, and that's how I became involved with Plants of Concern, which is a regional rare plant monitoring program uh, of the Chicago Botanic Garden. My first volunteer assignment with Plants of Concern sent me to Granger Woods, which is in Lake County. Um, and I eventually became a steward. And I finally had a why to, uh, to paint. The Morton Arboretum program would help nurture my deep love of plants and help me try to render them truthfully. This is a... This was my plants of concern assignment, Viola um, Labradorica. They, 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 used, they called the Viola conspersa, but the botanists changed the name. So throughout my life, I'm, I'm really grateful that I've constantly uh, encountered people who have helped me grow in understanding new thoughts, ideas, and skills. So this story could be a lot longer than it is, but leave it to say that painting takes time and commitment and maybe even some passion. Uh, finding a cohort of like-minded people is really important. I joined the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators at the behest of Suzanne Wegener on the right, who ran the Botanical and Scientific Art Program at Morton Arboretum. In fact, a uh, number of my instructors were also members of the guild. Suzanne Macy from Plants of Concern deputized me to represent her at an initial Wild Things conference meeting. Wild Things is a conference of uh, volunteers who go out into the field and help restore natural areas into good ecological health. They do monitoring uh, frogs, butterflies, dragonflies, plants, um, you name it. And, and they uh, are you know, kind of my, my tribe. So I was new to Plants of Concern. I was full of enthusiasm and 
and no idea what I was uh, getting myself into. That's, that's sort of a recurring theme, right? Uh, but since I didn't know how many, anything about native plants, except maybe orchids, they put me in charge of books and book sales and author signings, which is a position I held up to the, uh, the 20, 2021 Wild Things Conference, which was virtual. In 2007, the Oak Park Conservatory um, invited me to become its first artist in residence. I did, uh, illustrated a series of 14 educational pages, there's two, two here in front of you, for their adult and children's programs, highlighting their different botanical collections. My son Ian had bought me a Wacom tablet for Christmas, so I was able to do this work digitally, which was a real time saver. In 2009, um, I joined the American Society of Botanical Artists, and they put out a call for an exhibit titled Losing Paradise, Endangered Plants Here and Around the World. And the uh, requirements were that you uh, needed to feature, you needed to render a threatened or endangered plant species and have a partnership with a local scientist. So I asked Suzanne Macy if she would be my scientific contact and she agreed to collaborate. My painting of the yellow lady slipper orchid complex was submitted just under the wire, but it was accepted into the show. And then it was later featured in the uh, Smithsonian Magazine, Smithsonian in your classroom. My son, Ian, who had been consistently supportive of me since the beginning of my botanical art journey, uh, drove us to St. Louis, where I had the privilege of meeting one of my heroes, Dr. Peter Raven, at the show's opening at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Then it opened at the Chicago Botanic Garden. Then Ian flew with me later to Washington, D.C. for the long-awaited opening at the Smithsonian. From there, it went to Kew Gardens, London. The painting had taken on a life of its own. It also went to the New York Botanical Garden, but I hate New York, so I just didn't go there with him. It's very expensive, and I thought, well, I can only afford one plane ticket. This is the Washington DC is going to be, I mean, the Smithsonian, right? Um, so the, at the later Wild Things, I was introduced to Dr. Bill Alverson, who was working at the Field Museum at the time. Suzanne or somebody had told Bill that I drew orchids. And he asked me to do some drawings for his new project, Keys to Nature Orchids. I said, sure. I also did some illustrations of aster flower structures for another field museum online publication um, that was like a key to the asters. Barbara Birmingham, who was host of that first Wild Things meeting I mentioned earlier and mentored a many natural areas volunteers, asked if I could help her make some plant family drawings for the basic botany classes that she taught every month, the last Sunday of every month at her site, Theater Stone Forest Preserve. So because she had been really almost like a mentor to me, I couldn't say no, right? And it sounded like a fun challenge. So anyway, I wanted to learn more about our region's ecology and their flora, and this would be a great way to do that. This would turn out to be life-changing. So the plant family pages I did for Barb um, morphed pretty quickly into this form that you see here. Uh, it became a field museum publication, Common Plant Families of the Chicago Region, which has been downloaded over 9,000 times, um, and maybe more than that. Uh, then a friend talked me into joining Facebook. So I started a Native North American Orchid Conservation social media page, because why not, right? Because I'm very big into orchid conservation. So the folks at the Smithsonian Orchid Center, uh, a couple years later, found my page, and they realized it had the same name as their organization. Oops. Uh, I, I had no clue that they were a thing, okay? I just, this was, I just, I wanted to highlight conservation efforts for orchids, because I knew how threatened they were, and they're sort of like the canaries in the coal mine for ecosystem quality. So the, I was, um, 
Jay O'Neill reached out to me and asked, well, how about we just put our banner on your, on your page? Would that be okay? I'm like, would that be okay? Yes, of course, that will be okay. Thank you very much. This is amazing. Um, so I was, I was really speechless. Um, so that, that became another long and wonderful collaboration. So I found photographers for their pages. And eventually they decided to feature my artwork. I was the first uh, botanical art artist that they that they uh, had, and actually the, the only botanical artist on their gallery. It's called North, Native North American Orchid Conservation, I believe. So, um, and that's still up. You can look you can, if you Google my name and, and the uh, uh, Native North American Native Orchid Conservation, you should probably be able, able to like go right to that page. He did a beautiful job. It's like a whole multi-page gallery. So I continue to draw, paint, and do all the stuff that I need to do to pay, pay my bills. And then um, I would teach, I taught some botanical art classes in Oak Park. In early 2018, I was approached by Sarah Martin uh, by email, uh, who works at the Snight Museum of Art at Notre Dame University to teach some weekend botanical art classes in the fall. Who, me? Notre Dame, I don't know about this. How do they find me? Uh, so I thought, who can I ask to do this? I don't really feel, I don't know, really? I was really nervous about this. I mean, because Notre Dame's you know, big university and it's famous. And, you know. Anyway, so I did it, I did it. She talked me into doing it and she didn't tell me thankfully thankfully, that I would be teaching watercolor pencil to a group of art teachers. So I'm really grateful that I over-prepared on the botany end of this. I had a 25-page handout for each of them about art and pigments and botany. And, and, and so they love the cross-disciplinary uh, perspective that I offered. And we just had a, we had a great time. So I did a few of those uh, classes there. And... Uh, And it was it was life changing to me because I felt that I I hadn't taught art. I taught art earlier at the um, Hyde Park Art Center before my son was born, but I hadn't done anything really like that since. So getting myself back into the mindset of how do you communicate to people how to draw how to see how to render something how to see color it's complex but then i i'm one of these people that if i put my mind to something i'm going to do it if i can do it i'm going to do it and so i did um, so then um, later that late summer 2018 the uh, Field Museum uh, contacted me to say that all the rapid color guides needed to be updated to the most current taxonomy. No problem. I had a copy of the new 2017 floor of the Chicago region at hand, a piece of cake. Just swap one scientific name for another one, right? No. Um, Everything was fine and dandy until I came to the iris family, Iridaceae, and the blue-eyed grasses. So I read the old key and Swink and Wilhelm's plants of the Chicago region, which had been my reference for the iris page in 2012 for the first set of, of common plant families of the Chicago region. Then I read the key and the flora. No matter how much I studied, the new species continued to remain cryptic. Uh, when you, you take a deep dive into botany and you, you know, you're learning the names of all these plants and you're learning the names of the features and it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's, it, you have to immerse yourself in it for a while and it's an amazing process, but it, if you're not confident about all the different features, you, you, it's best to work with a botanist. So I reached out to Dr. Gerald Wilhelm, who was the senior author of this book, and, he, and I explained my, my concern about these pages and the need for the pages to be, to be correct. And he said, no problem. 
meet me at the herbarium and we'll take a look. And so a couple weeks later, we met at the herbarium at Morton Arboretum. And he pulled out after page after page of specimens, the herbarium. And he was carefully explaining to me what each of these were and how to tell the, the different species apart. And some of them are like details of like just millimeters. And so I wanted to communicate this in these, in these guides. The guides are for restoration volunteers and for the general public. And so people can learn about plants because, you know, back when I was in high school, they weren't teaching botany anymore. And botany is really important, you know, because if you, plants are the foundation of all life on earth. So he also found all my typos. So, right? So five hours later, and this is somebody who charges $1,000 an hour for his speaking fees, okay? Um, I, had, I had pages and pages of notes. And, and then he insisted that I come back with the corrected versions and he would look at them and sign off on them. So um, then he said, you know, it might be even more helpful if you added a few more plant families. Okay. So I don't know if you're interested in plants or not, but when you're drawing plants, it's really important to know what they are and to know some of the history of the study of plants in our in our region. So this particular specimen looks uh, just like a, any old dead plant on a page, right? But if you take a closer look, um, here here in the the lower right hand corner, there is a there is a label, and the label says plants of the Lake Chicago Basin. So that's basically anywhere in the Chicago region, and it was collected by Donald C. Peaty and Donald. Uh, Carl Ross Petey was the author of a number of wonderful nature guides, and he was one of those, probably the most popular nature author of his time. He was like the David Attenborough of his day. Um, and this was the, this is number 139. So this was his 139th collection at the beginning of his botanical career. And he has in this beautiful script, Habernaria ciliaris, and you, no, I mean, I had to look again, and only because I knew what the, the species was. That's an H um, railroad ditch. And then above that, you have the common, the current uh, botanical name, Platanthra ciliaris L. Linnaeus Lindley, which just describes all the different changes in Texan taxonomy that have happened um, in the last about 100 years. So this specimen's 100 years old, and it says the Field Museum. So today, we know that um, the railroad rights of way are home of the last refuges of our native flora. And uh, periodic fires from trains kept them clear of invasive brush. These precious remnants are full of rare plants, and they were sought out and documented in the 1960s and 1970s by Dr. F. Betts of Northeastern University, um, along with uh, Pioneer Cemetery Prairies, and every effort was made to save them. Petey, the, 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 the collector on this uh, specimen, went on to become uh, a student of Harvard study botany with the famous Merritt Lyndon Fernald, who was one of the most notable editors of Gray's Manual of Botany. So uh, Petey's narrative of Prairie Grove talks about the Kennecott home, which is called the Grove in Glenview. And that is a, a wonderful little remnant place on Milwaukee Avenue, um, not far uh, from, uh, I think it's River Trail Nature Center on the other side of Milwaukee, and also kind of cheek by jowl by a McDonald's and a little remnant prairie called Peacock Prairie, owned by the University of Illinois. 
But uh, Robert Kennicott is famous for founding the Chicago Academy of Science, and then he went to the Smithsonian. So he, Robert Kennicott also helped save the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore from development. So uh, there's an entire history of Chicago area science and conservation that's written on this page if you just take, take a moment and connect the dots and, 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 and read it. And so is, it is with many herbarium sheets. They're certainly worth the study. In 2019, Emma England, who is president of Lake County Audubon Society, reached out to me and asked if I had any illustrations of Dunsland's plants to teach her piping plover monitors and the locals about the floor of Waukegan Beach for their program sharing our shores. Now, I don't know if you remember last, uh, last year, last couple of years during COVID, the nature community has been really entertained by the antics of uh, two piping plovers named Monty and Rose, who uh, um, made their home at Montrose Dunes. Unfortunately, this year, uh, Monty uh, uh, passed away on the dunes and uh, he was, his body was taken to the uh, Lincoln Park Zoo and they, they did some forensics on it and they found out it was an avian flu. It was uh, some kind of a, a fungal infection, but he, he and his, his little, uh, baby piping plovers kept us all kind of hopeful throughout the two years of the depth of COVID uh, while the, the beach was closed off to, to any kind of uh, beach going activity. And um, it just was, um, it was a high point in a low, you know, in a low time for many of us. So uh, when Emma England asked me to do this guide, I thought, well, sure. Um, but then, it, it, you know, because I, by that time I was also the steward of a Dunesland site, I could see some possibilities for these guides being um, a good educational material, not just for the, for the birders at Waukegan Beach and elsewhere, but by our volunteers at Illinois Beach State Park, Chihuahua Prairie, and my, my own site, uh, Hosa, Hosa Prairie. So uh, the, first, the first guide started five pages and then it morphed to seven and then the field museum got involved and morphed to 14. And uh, in the meantime, I had checked with plants of concern because many of the ubiquitous um, Dunesland species are also on the state endangered species list. And so you don't want to mention one of the plants of concern rules is you don't mention an endangered plant with its site because people will come and dig them up. So we decided to make it a more regional guide. So then I reached out to local stewards and they sent me their species list or what they think at least should be included in the guide. And that's what I drew from. And the Field Museum uh, ended up publishing it again. The Nature Conservancy uh, wanted a bandana to celebrate the piping plover's return to Montrose Beach. So I took some of those illustrations from the Dunesland Habitat Guide, and then I designed a bandana for the plover monitors and the other Dunesland volunteers. Then while I was working on these additional plant families, Dr. Wilhelm asked me if I would be interested in contributing a few new illustrations to a much asked for illustrated glossary for the floor of the Chicago region that had been published a couple of years before. It was so jam packed of information that they had to leave out the illustrated glossary that had been in the, in the prior edition, which I think was like 1984. And I said, sure, but then we didn't know where the original illustrations from the uh, plants in the Chicago region were. And, and I'm looking at them and they're his style, um, John Nelson's style isn't anything like mine. I'm like, these aren't gonna look good together. They're just not. So I offered to do, to redo them. And they said, basically they said, it's crazy. And then the first thing they said, well, we can't afford to pay you to redo all of them. I said, well, I'm not, you've really helped me a lot in, in my, botanical, my botanical journey. I'll do this just to do it. 
And then they said you were crazy. I was crazy. And I said, well, that, you know, you knew that, right? Um, so that turned into 14 pages and, 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 and eight months of my life. And then they, we had to put a glossary in there and I ended up proofreading that on top of my day job and everything else, right? Um, so the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators, where I'm on the editorial board now, um, went on to publish an article doc, written by Dr. Wilhelm on this project. And so there's a there's a, his book, Floor of the Chicago Region, and some excerpts and my illustrations from that. Well, and I wanted to go back to my my woodland guide. So I want really I, I'm a steward of woodland, and I want to learn about the plants of the woodlands. And the, one of the ways that I I can learn about plants is to draw them, right? So. He said, well, it would be much more useful if you're, unless you're going to render all the plants conceivably been in any of these Western seg sector woodlands, which is thousands of plants. It would be much more useful just to do a guide for instance, and lycophytes and lycophytes are um, like vascular plants like uh, uh, horse horse tails and, uh, and and club mosses and things like that. And I said, sure. Okay, so that that became a thing. And so now that and the glossary are now up on the Conservation Research Institute website. These are some illustrations that I did for Friends of the Forest Preserves uh, Natural Events Calendar. I just kind of tucked them in there because it's so very from the other like scientific work that I do. And these were block prints. So that's got a whole other backstory I'm not going to bother you with. But then this grant came up. So this is this brings us up to the uh, the present the present year. Uh, orchids, botanical art, an outreach to new and unsuspecting audiences. So you know, here's an opportunity through this grant from the American Society of Botanical Artists to combine uh, op botanical art education and orchids, but which orchids? Because there's 50 species of orchids that live in Illinois. And that's, I mean, I am working on a full um, suite of paintings of all of them, but for this particular grant, if we're gonna focus, do some research, we need to limit our study. And so my my uh, my site, Hosa Park, is part of a Ramsar dedicated wetland that encompasses Chewaukee Prairie in the north and Waukegan Beach on the south. And the Ramsar Convention for Wetlands uh, dedicates wetlands of international importance. So it was a big deal in 2015. This became part of their um, their their Ramsar stable, as it were, of uh, of protected areas. So um, the lakefront and the plants there and the habitats there are subject to um, erosion and lake level fluctuations and uh, draconian lakeshore engineering devices along with invasive species, trampling, poaching, leashless dogs, littering, and general disregard for nature along the beach. So I decided to orchid, I'll highlight the orchids of the Dunesland, which represent actually 50% of the species of orchids in our region. We have two species of orchids that have been documented from the Chicago wilderness region. So then in order to accomplish this, I had to figure out which orchids had been here. And then I went back to the herbariums. Uh, so I scanned through thousands of mostly but not all digitized herbarium specimens in several regional collections. Um, and none of this research would have been possible without the work of hundreds of dedicated scientists um, who have collected, identified, annotated, prepared these specimens, not to mention the herbarium curators who dried, labeled, accessioned, scanned, cataloged and very carefully, very delicately filed them for future generations of study. It's sort of like a library of plants, like 
a reference library of plants. I pick up one of the specimens, I really feel like the weight of a hundred or more years of, of botanical history in my hands. It's a living connection to Bob name here. Agnes Chase, Ellsworth Jerome Hill, Julian Steiermark, Fred Case, Floyd Swink, Frank Caleb Gates, Ray Schulenberg, and many others. Agnes Chase has a really fascinating history. She was a um, agristologist that she was arrested and force fed um, and uh, she had to write her own grants to get money to go do her explorations in South America. There's quite a bit about her, but she was actually from Illinois. Um, so the challenge to go through all these specimens and identify which ones were from the region, which ones have been found between Shawaki Prairie and Waukegan Beach, um, was was kind of daunting, but I um, I have I've, I've completed this piece of my research. The next question was, how many of these orchids still remain? Out of the twenty one species that I identified from the herbarium record, are any of these? And so that that became the other piece of my research project. One of my fun experiences for this project was learning how the eastern prairie fringed orchid had been saved from near extinction. Uh, this is a federally threatened species. And it was saved because there are a dedicated group of volunteers who go out each summer and find, document, and hand pollinate the orchids. This is not an easy task by any means. First of all, it's usually very wet. We're talking about head, cattails over your head. So it's really easy to get lost. And there are ankle busting sedge, sedges that may, may the cattails. And you have to find your way through all of this to where the orchids are, through with a GPS device. And you have, have to not like get lost. Uh, getting there or getting back. There are usually mosquitoes, biting flies, ticks, sun, heat, wind, rain, whatever. So you have, then you have to collect data on each plant. And you have to count and measure the, all of its parts and enter that, that data into a database. Then you collect the pollinia. The pollinia are male parts of the flower that help you know, create the, the, the fruit. And then you put those on a styrofoam cup and you carry that styrofoam cup to the next plant. And then you have to keep records of each of these crosses and you have to be very opalinia. Oh, um, threatened species, they're state endangered and there's like maybe 500 of these plants in the state of Illinois. So, so just I just sharing the story to have a sense of the patience and dedication of these volunteers that go out and they do this every single year. And they've been doing this for, I think, 40 years now. You know, and 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 the plants don't just stay in one place, they move. The plants don't live very long. They live four or five years after they've bloomed and then then they then they die. And it takes about uh, between seven and 15 years for to go from a seed uh, in, a, in the ground to a blooming plant. So keeping track of these plants is kind of tricky. So Kathy Pollock from U.S. Fish and Wildlife commissioned me to do this illustration for her volunteers this year. Every year she likes to give her volunteers a, a, a gift, a thank you gift for their work. So that's what I did for them. Let's see, it's kind of hard to read here. So the ability to discover and study these orchids kind of uh, 
it goes back to the legacy of people in the late 1960s and early 70s and the, uh, the Environmental Policy Act from that time and a, really a pioneering effort to preserve all the remnant areas um, as I Illinois uh, commerce expanded. Illinois has less than one one hundredth of one percent of its uh, native prairies left. Illinois is called the prairie state, but we really have very, very, very little, little prairie left. And so here we have uh, Dr. Bob Betts, uh, Ray Schulenberg, Floyd Swink, uh, the legacy of George Fell, Steve Packard, and Jerry Wilhelm. Uh, the list of, ver of these people who have saved these natural areas is really, really long. And their protégés learned from them and are now teaching us what what is what is happening? My my mentor Jerry Wilhelm, who's the person on the far left, and very young Jerry Wilhelm then, probably this was at least 40, 45 years ago. Uh, all these other all these other men are long gone. Uh, are part of um, a long uh, legacy of people who really cared about the environment who cared about life on earth, who cared about our future, and who cared about sustainability. So that brings me back kind of to the purpose of my project, which is education and outreach to new audiences, many in low income and underserved communities. Um, so using herbarium specimens and my personal field notes and drawings, because I monitor most, if not all of these orchids, and a few photos, I render the plants in black and white to determine scale, layout, and composition, and then uh, send the drawings for review to a team of orchid specialists. And then after all the changes are made, uh, the final drawings are approved, then I render them in black and white, and from black and white I render them into color on watercolor paper. And then the, 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 the collection for this project uh, will be uploaded to a website, content written, translated into Spanish. So we have really a diversity of audience that's a, that, that, is, has, uh, uh, that we, can, we can appeal to. So in scientific illustration, the greatest challenge is learning enough about the subject to really see it. And so as a teacher, that's what I try to do. I get people to try to like see what's in front of them, to see what they're seeing. And, and it's a, a process and everybody approaches it differently. But uh, I love to teach people how to see color, how to put a name to all of these different things that they're looking at. And it's, a, it's really a joyous experience for me. We have to understand that each, each species of plant um, has been given a name by a, by a botanist and a taxonomist um, and separating it from another species that could be similar but may live in a very different habitat. So learning what these differences are is really what the study of field botany is all about. It's not about DNA, because DNA sequencing won't te teach you anything really about what a plant looks like or where it lives. It will teach you about the relationships between that plant and some other. But we need what we need herbariums for and we need botanists for are to teach people about the plants where they live, their interconnections to pollinators, and all the other organisms that that they share that they share a habitat with, and also what's important is keeping the habitats that they live in healthy. The native orchids only live in, for the most part, they only live in remnant natural areas, areas that haven't been plowed or disturbed by. Uh, by pollution, uh, by you know, torn up by roads, uh, been dumped on. They're, they they need a certain 
certain quality of soil. And in order to keep these natural areas healthy, um, we need to be very efficient about their care. And one of the, the, the most efficient, least expensive ways to manage our natural areas is through prescribed fire. So here I've got this uh, nice young man with a drip torch taking care of a remnant prairie. So hopefully this study of botany will help lead to concerns for our natural areas and advocacy for their proper care. To assist in our understanding of where our native orchids might remain, in the following weeks, we're gonna be conducting field surveys for extant orchids based on these herbarium specimens and data from plants of concern. Invasive species presence will, or other threats will be uh, noted. And then the data will be sent to the land managers uh, to help guide their management decisions. To write out this experience, I'm going to be bringing um, my Get Your Botany on roots and shoots materials around the area. And then, you know, get people drawing plants and learning about plants. So far, I have two library exhibits of my artwork set up and one uh, next year in Volo Bog. So uh, you never know really where your inner your inner teacher is going to lead you. Um, I got to meet Jane Goodall a few years ago and when I, was, I put my Roots and Shoots presentation together. And so here I am with uh, Jane and my friend Carol Cullen, who's a founding member of uh, West Cook Wild Ones and my friend Nikki Strahl, who works for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. And, uh, and Carolyn's uh, daughter, Mary. So anyway, thank you so much for your attention. And I hope, uh, I hope this has given you some background on what uh, scientific illustration and botanical illustration uh, does as, it, as its goal in teaching people about the science of plants and some of its wider implications as far as uh, as far as conservation education. Thank you. Any questions? You're welcome. So as I said, it's, it was very much like, like Ariadne's maze, the, the Minotaur. Um, you know, every time I go and I talk to people, I sort of feel like I'm facing the Minotaur down. I'm not very comfortable with public speaking, but it's, uh, I, I I also feel that if somebody isn't telling the story, the story isn't gonna to get told. And the story is really important about the preservation of our natural areas and, and the human connection to nature. It's something that is, it's primal for all of us, right? I mean, I, I, there's something, you go out into nature that will adapt Japanese even have a word for it. It's called forest bathing. If you, uh, people who have uh, some sort of uh, hard to diagnose um, malaise, the first thing a Japanese doctor will do is, is say, there's a shirinyoku, I think is the word, but send them out into the forest. And we know through the work of Richard Louvre, who wrote uh, No Child Left Inside, um, in the, uh, this na nature movement, that uh, children especially need, need to be outdoors. They need to connect to nature. It's not just breathing fresh 
here and having room to run, but there is a, uh, there are deeper connections or deeper spiritual connections. Um, a lot of people don't know, uh, I have a, a degree in theology from uh, Loyal University. And when I was taking one of my classes at Dominican University with a woman who is the head of uh, religious education for the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Chicago, she was teaching us about Lexio Divina, what's a Lexio Divina's holy reading. So you're reading the Bible, you're reading a commentary in the Bible, you're reading the lives of the saints and that sort of thing. She said, but what a lot of people don't realize is that there's another Lexio. I'm like, okay, what is this? And she said, Lexio Natura, which means reading the book of nature. Now, forgive me for putting on my Sunday school hat right now. But, but so Lexio Natura, the, the foundation of that is if we believe that something much greater than us, whatever you want to call it, made the universe made the earth and everything that is on the earth, that it wasn't just some random occurrence, that here you have human beings that are that come up in a relationship with this nature. And that this nature is teaching us about our relationship with creation with one another and with our I some people call our higher power or God or divinity and and that that was kind of life changing for me in a way it, it helped me really see nature with a much deeper respect than just oh there's a tree over there and here's a lawn or here the, the flower garden is nice or isn't this I I started to have a sense of really the sacred nature as 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 sacred as anything. Now, when when I was uh, when my son was uh, eighteen months old, my friend Paul, I went out to see my friend Paula um, in San Francisco, and she took us to Muir Woods. And here is Muir Woods, and. You know, I've been in some beautiful cathedrals. I've been in Salisbury Cathedral in England and Holy Name Cathedral, and I taught at the cathedral, Episcopal Cathedral of St. James in Chicago. And, and these are all beautiful, beautiful places made by man. But Muir Woods was as much a cathedral as any of those, and it was not made by man. And not only that, but those trees can make babies, baby trees that will grow up and become giant trees. And we can't do that. Human beings, as much as we try, we can't make something that, I mean, we can certainly mess with its genes, right? But we have to start with something that was already living material. He have not yet figured, uh, decoded, and I don't know if he even should, that piece of nature that can replicate itself in, in, in such beautiful diversity that we have here. And so I always stand in really profound awe uh, when I go out into these, these woods and I go out and I restore them. Uh, we got, we're out there with chainsaws and bow saws and loppers and you know, uh, I don't I don't do drip torches, although that looks kind of like a lot of fun. Um, and I actually don't do chainsaws. I have friends who do that that are much better at that than I might be. Uh, but we go out there and we remove invasive species and then we see how things come back. And it's just miraculous. It's just miraculous work. And sometimes the land is so degraded that you need to give it a little help and you put, you know, restore some native uh, seeds to it and kind of see how they do. There's an entire community of thousands of people in the Chicago region that are devoted to this. And I always thought, gee, you know, 
the churches are losing people right and left. What is it about, the, the, is there a disconnect to reality there? Why are they not out saying, hey, let's restore our connection to nature? And maybe that will give them some relevance in the 21st century. It is, and we were, we were designed to live in harmony with nature. Okay, this is who we are. This is the essence of our humanity. We are designed to live in harmony with nature and with one another. Now, I also, you know, my, my day job is early childhood education, and I and I know we're designed to live in harmony with with one another, but when you get like, you know, you know, a dozen dozen preschoolers in a room, it doesn't quite always work out that way. And so why would we expect grownups to do any better? I'm not really sure. Um, because we, you know, we have we are ego driven. The wonderful thing about plants is plants are not ego driven, they're not tenure tracked, they don't have any opinions, they don't, you know, they're not acquisitive. They just want to live, they want to live in peace. And so I think they have so much to teach us spiritually about uh, what is what is real and what is important. Um, and so when we develop healthy relationships with these plants and with the sites in which we steward, I mean, it's a, such a privilege to be part of a, the life of an ongoing life of a site. And having having that as something that I go and I do two or three two or three weekends a month or two or three Saturdays or Sundays a month uh, it keeps me out it keeps me healthy it keeps me engaged with a community of like-minded folk um, and it's very real you know and I don't know when I'm a, you know here I'm you know my this is a whole nother world here you know, and our young people, this is the kind of almost the only world they know. Unless we show them something else. And, you know, and, and, and they, so they need both and. And sometimes, so they've developed a, an app called Seek or iNaturalist where people can, and there's actually like a little community around it where people are trying to learn the names of plants and do with modest results. Um, the algorithms are getting better, but still there are plants that, you know, you're not gonna be able to tell really what they are unless you have a microscope and you have, you have a, the, the ability to read a botanical key, such as in the floor of the Chicago region and so on. So, yeah, there's always a chance there's a challenge there's a challenge so we we need to continue to st study botany and get our kids outdoors and and reach out to new audiences and uh get get people uh, looking at plants and drawing plants and and finding a deep satisfaction in that because you know i and as i said i i manage like four social media pages. I'm an admin of wild things, and I'm, a, I'm the prime admin of Native North American Native or Orchid Conservation and Native Bee Awareness. I don't know how I got involved with that one. Um, oh, my friend Libby Hill asked me, but I don't. I don't do much with that. And 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 then and then I have uh, I have like little social media sites for my for my two restoration. Uh, Area, Granger Woods and, and Hosa Park. And that's just a way where we can like put up pictures and, you know, let people know we're going to have a work day or whatever. So it's nothing really too serious. But, you know, people are on social media all the time and they get in arguments with people about these things. And, and, and there's even antidotes to that because there's actually a social media page called Illinois Botany on Facebook. And so it, you can learn a lot about the plants that are here and ask questions because a lot of regional experts and actually 
national experts are there. So, so, the, you know, so there's this other side, the upside, I call it the upside of social media, is that, um, that you, you can develop, you can develop a really cool peer group, but you also need to get outside. You need to get outside and, and just, and, and no matter what the weather is, and just see what's coming up. Was your work also influenced by like the Victorian like plates you would see, like the illustrated uh, specimens of, because I know you talked about the ones that you'd seen in the museum that were actually the preserved specimens. Were you also influenced by those ones from, like you see the Victorian plates with the illustrated? Uh, and what was the medium they used for most of that? Well, yes, yes, and no. So that was that was watercolor. Most of those were done. Some of them were done on vellum, which is calfskin, or they were done on um, on paper. Um, vellum is still used for botanical art, um, and it's very expensive. I mean, a little piece like this is like you know thirty dollars. Big sheet is like a lot of money. I don't. I don't do that. That is a whole nother it's a whole nother discipline and a whole nother way of working that <clears throat> I'm I'm trying to my work is is really about communication. But yeah, so I love William Morris. There's an exhibit of his work at the Art Institute right now. Um but I am really mostly influenced by the plants themselves. Now there is a there's a genre of botanical art that is very concerned about the filling the page and and many of those and I have a I have a, a good friend she and I exhibited at the um, the the Smithsonian together uh, a couple of them in fact that their paintings uh, the plants in the paintings don't really look like the plants do in nature though They'll turn them around and then like make them kind of do crazy things and to fill the space and all of that. And like, I don't know. See, so I, I have more of a because I've been working, I guess, with Dr. Wilhelm for so more. I want it to look exact, more true to nature. Yes, I want it to be a truthful representative of that plant, so somebody can look at that plant and know what it is. Unlike herbarium, uh, unlike early herbals, okay, so the early herbals probably were beautifully illustrated. People looked at these plants, but then the herbals would get copied. And if you and if you look at the herbals from you know the earliest to the later to the later, they, they become completely unrecognizable. But the herbals were really important in teaching people what these plants were because they were medicinal medicinal plants, plants that could heal you, plants that could kill you, uh, food plants. Um, and then, then you know, late, later on in uh, the 1700s and the late 1600s and 1700s, you have the, you know, the, the, you have the voyages to South America and to the Captain Cook and People are coming back with all of these plants and they want to document them. The plants aren't going to stay fresh. So you're trying to paint these plants. They would actually bring artists with them on the, on the voyage to paint them. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of wonderful history that, that's written about, about the, the documentation of these, these voyages and all the plants that they found, you know. So, uh, and that's still that's still going on today. You know, the Missouri Botanical Garden is working on a floor of China, and that hasn't been completed yet. I mean, there are plants that are still being found that are new to science, and so you have scientific illustrators that are um, that they bring the plants to, and then they do the scientific drawings of them. Um, you know, they might use a camera lucida or what, what, what have you. They're working under microscopes. Uh, so there's a real discipline to that. And then, then keys are written and, and then these things are published. And so it, it does contribute to our, our overall knowledge of the earth. And, and, but it's also important that, to know that we 
have ecological connections to, to the earth. It's not just scientists over there doing stuff that's cool or interesting and kind of esoteric, but that we can do things that are, that are important as well. Uh, there's a, a woman, many of you may know of, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote a book, Braiding Sweetgrass. In the first part of this book, Braiding Sweetgrass, um, she, she talks about her students and kind of how, how, how disconnected her students feel because they, they don't feel like they, that, that everything is so messed up they can't make a difference. And so Robin has to work really hard with these students to teach them that, yes, you need to do this work. You need to be part of these the life of these 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 areas and the these plants and to learn about them um, and so that was that was really interesting to me to hear her her talk about her students anyway she wrote a couple books gathering braiding sweet grass and gathering moss gathering moss i haven't read yet but i've um, been on a couple of zoom zoom presentations with her and i really I recommend the book. It's 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 readable, and some of it's very challenging. Um, but you know, she speaks from a um, a Native American perspective, and and she and and she, her story is very parallel to mine because she went to college and she wanted to study botany, and they and so he, the her the guy who is she was interviewing said, well why do you want to study botany she says well i want to know why you know the, the golden rods are so beautiful in the fall with the gentians and the you know he says well if, you know if your question's about beauty why aren't you studying art you know why aren't you you know enroll in visual arts? no i want to understand about the plants and and somehow she got in. So she said she has a doctorate in botany, and um, but it wasn't easy. I mean, she she had to she had to work, and and as an indigenous person, um, she had the, there was there was a lot of I think prejudice against her, thinking, oh, she, you know, why is she taking up space in a classroom? You know, that some somebody out more deserving might have might have had but anyway so this was before um before i think the the the, the there was a sea change in awareness and thankfully that you know now i think we're much more inclusive and, and open and, and curious about people and less judgmental well, back to the naturalistic yes Well, yes, no. So I think that I don't know much about Ikebana, but I do know that there are a lot of uh, canons to it. There are a lot of rules. And what they're trying to show is a little bit of as above, so below. And so you're trying to um, capture something very essential in your flower arrangement that says something about the relationship between uh, humans um, and nature and in the spiritual world. Um, and so you'll see a lot of things that are like, tri like triangular shapes. And so each of those things have a symbolism to them. It's really, there's a, there's a philosophical underpinning to, to Ikebana that is above and beyond just making beautiful arrangements of, of flowers. Um, yeah, so that, so yeah, so this is one of my, this was one, the, one of my uh, watercolors. This is an original watercolor of, uh, that I did from life of Paphiopetalum spicerinum. And I think I probably spent nine or 10 hours on that. So it's, it, I, I would say somewhere between nine and 14 hours 
not including the finding the plant, doing the preliminary drawing, just like sitting down and, and doing and doing the painting. So I'd have to. Well, that's a really, I mean, there's, there's a little bit of botanical art snobbery. Okay, if you're not drawing from life, you know, it's sort of like, hmm. I think there's a real art in taking a, taking a dead herbarium plant and bringing it back to life. And actually, one of my one of my teachers at Morton Arboretum, Arlene Hilt Donnelly, who's senior scientific illustrator at the Field Museum in Natural History, actually taught us how to do that. And uh, so we would you're not you're not touching these 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 specimens, but you are recreating. You're taking measurements, and you're using wire, and you're using you're using uh, d different kinds of uh, foil tape, like you use for um, HVAC, like HVAC tape, silver HVAC tape, and and anything to like recreate this polymer clay, whatever. So there's a lot of ways that you can. My mom used to say there's a lot of ways you skin a cat. There's a lot of ways you can re recreate some of these, so that you can cat capture the the light on it. Um, but this was actually, these are done from life. I try to work from life as far as possible. Um, when I can't work from life, I work from herbarium specimens. And because I have a lot of experience working from life, I can, re, I can recreate these, these plants in my head by now. But that takes time and like just lots and lots of painting experience. Um, and you know, you can use reference photographs, but reference photographs will not have all the information you need. So that's why you really need to like really study the plant. Uh, when I teach botanical art, we usually start with really simple subjects. And, 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 and it's, it's about learning how, how, to, how to draw accurately, measuring and, and, and just seeing, seeing color and seeing the shapes and seeing, seeing the light on the, on the subject. Sure. So, well, what you do, what I, what I do with a lot of my students, the first thing I have them do is I have them, um, I take. I, I take, I'm not gonna do this for these classes, but the, 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 one of the simplest things to do is to take a cereal box, okay? A cereal box or a, you know, a snack box. And you know, it's, you've got like the brown cardboard on the other side of the package. So you, you know, you cut the box, the box apart, and you take off the sides and you've got the big, the rectangular pieces. And then I take a black colored pencil and a white colored pencil. And I take an egg, just a hard boiled egg. Hard boiled eggs are better because if they fall on the floor, right? So, so then you put the egg on one of the pieces of cardboard, and then the other egg you're going to draw. And I always recommend people draw life size. You measure, you know, get used to the, just drawing life size. And so all you really need to do is draw the highlight side. You what you want is like a light, um, like a little like a little target task lamp you know, like a little bedside lamp or something. So you have a, a, a clearly lit side and a clearly shaded side. And so you, you have, uh, generally speaking, if you're right hand, the light's gonna come from your left, so you're not drawing in your own shadow. Um, and if you're, left, if you're left hand, if you're left handed, then it's the reverse. So then you just, you know, you, you draw the light side of the egg and, and you put a lot of pressure where that highlight is, and then just less where the egg, the, the edge of the egg is. And then you draw the, the cast shadow, the base of the cast shadow, where, where the, the shadow, where the egg meets the board, and then feather out the shadow. And you've got to get, all you did was this little section here, and this little section here, and all of a sudden you have it, like, wow, that looks like an egg. I should have brought a sample. But it's so simple. It takes me like two minutes to show people how to do this. And I'm like, wow. I was going to ask about that. Some of the specimens you've drawn, if they have like the less detail they have, like do you find them harder to draw? Like it's over, like it's just like 
Yeah, so so with the white with the white orchids, that was a challenge because uh, with the white orchids, the you know and white white the botanical standard is white watercolor paper. Um, I took a I, I took a clue from one of my botanical painting heroes, with she's a man named um, our uh, Valentine, who was a Brookwood Potter designer, Brookwood Potter pottery designer, and he. He, he's got a whole nother long backstory. I don't have time for that. But he, he there was a, an exhibit of his work at the Field Museum, and he works on tinted paper. And these paintings of plants, so he illustrated the floor of California. Well, like not the whole floor of California, which is immense, but he illustrated over a thousand of them before he died. Um, these paintings just completely jump off the paper. They are so beautifully rendered and I I actually figured out how long it took him to paint each one of these and he had like a three day window to paint these he had somebody going out into the field and collecting the plants keeping them fresh enough so that he could draw them and then paint them and then finish this I don't know how honest I don't know how he did this because this was you know early on in the 20th century so um yeah, his work, it's in, it's in the, I think, the San Diego Art Museum. If you look for a Valentine, it's like Valentine, except the last two uh, vowels are, are switched, so E-I-N. He's uh, amazing, amazing, beautiful work. And, and so I thought, well, if he can do it, then I can paint, I can paint white orchids on toned paper, too. And so that's what I did. And it, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Um, but the botanical art standard is you only work from live specimens and you're only working on white paper or vellum, calf skin. I think the vegans would be horrified. Right. Um, but that, I mean, the thing about vellum, okay, so all the British land deeds are all done in vellum. You know, as a librarian, right, that, that that's... Well, anyway, so that's, that's, uh, there's a lot, all kinds of like rabbit holes you can go down when you're learning about, about botanical art or natural history. Um, I'm grateful that there's still people alive who can teach, continue to teach about, about these things. And I feel very blessed that I've, you know, made, made friends with people who have been just out, really outstanding mentors in this work like Dr. Wilhelm and uh, Paul Markham and people who are, um, uh, uh, Paul Catling, Dr. Paul Catling and uh, Dr. Kenneth Cameron and Dr. Melissa McCormick from the Smithsonian who have been my advisors on this ORCID project. I'm like, I, you know, if you're, if you're gonna ask people for help, you may just like go right to the top Right. I mean, well, the, the, the rationale is they could, if they say no, okay, fine. But they didn't. Yeah. yeah so, so that's, that's been pretty cool. And I, I, I actually met Dr. Catling's uh, daughter, Pauline, at a SEDGE conference a couple weeks ago down in Bloomington. I was asked to, um, go to that because I the Illinois Indiana Academy of Science asked me to um, contribute some illustrations for the end papers of a book by Paul Dr. Paul Rothrock on the the uh, the Carrick sedges of Indiana so I came down and I helped with the conference and made myself useful and got to go on a field trip and I went to the art museum down there at Bloomington which is outstanding and uh, yeah that was fun that was fun. So. Well, it's, I mean, 
I'm at, I'm at an age now where if I'm not having fun, or like my friend Barbara Bell says, if you're not curious, forget it. Just, you know, find things that buoy you up, that give you a purpose. You know, for getting up in the morning. I mean, because there's, you've got, you you know, we have to attend to our day-to-day -day responsibilities, right? That's what do we call adulting, which is, you know, like not always the most fun thing, but you have to do it. But then when I'm done adulting, I still have a block of time during my, you know, during my week where I can go out and do things that are really fun. So instead of going and buying like the latest clothes, I go out and I, I go and I pull sweet clover and bus buckthorn and I go count rare plants and you know, go out into a natural area and you see something that you, you know the name of and you say, oh, hi there. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you have, and Robin Will Kimmerer talks about this too, this, that sacred thou of, these, of, of, of these, these creatures. She calls them more than human beings. The Native Americans kind of knew this intuitively that you have a relationship with nature, and so, as you know, you know, city girl, I'm still learning this, but I like to. No. I had no idea it existed, but I'm sort of walking through there, and I turned. I'm like, what? It looks like, like in some of the stores, like they'll make up their own like little Christmas trees, like those like swatchy crystals and all right. That's what this thing was. It was like probably eight feet tall or so. It's on some small island in Spain. And I just, it took up most of my time there. It was totally, it made the trip totally worth it. I mean, that's a beautiful place. As I'm sure you know already, but it was totally unexpected. And what I look forward to seeing next time I go there. Is this in the greenhouse? No, it's actually outside. I think it's by the English garden. Oh, okay. I'll have to check the, it uh, out. East of the village there. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, it was amazing. The uh, Illinois Orchid Society also has an annual show at the Botanic Garden. Um, it's been kind of like co-opted by, by spectacle, I feel. I hope this isn't on the record. Um, but but the, the, the Illinois, Illinois Orchid Society has a society show that's inside of the, the big show which is spectacular, but the, but the cool part of that show is when the Illinois American Society members bring their treasured personal collections and they're being judged uh, by the American Orchid Society. These things are, are super rare. They're really interesting. They're usually these teeny little, these teeny little plants or they're, they're huge, but they're not something you're going to find at Trader Joe's for sure. Okay. And, and that is always really interesting to me. I was actually on the board of the Illinois Orchid Society for a while as a newsletter editor and I, I just can't do everything. And then I got involved with natural areas restoration and I had said, no, I have to, I, this, this, I can do this, this, and this. And so I can paint, I can paint, I can adult, I can be with my family and, and I can, and I can be a natural areas uh, volunteer and that's about, and that's about it. Did you ever get back to any of your early interests, the woodworking, the drafting, did you ever explore any other areas like that? Well, funny you have, so when I was teaching Sunday school, I was involved with a program called the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, which is a Montessori based uh, early childhood uh, faith formation program. And so I actually had to teach myself how to do woodworking because a lot of these, a lot of these materials um, were made up were made out of wood. So, so yes, and I, um, I learned basketry from a friend who learned who uh, 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 li lived across the street. And I was uh, at one point before I was doing any of this other stuff. Um, I was a, a living a living history demonstrator at Growie Mill, and I would make uh, egg baskets there at the mill. So that was kind of fun. I'd dress up in 19th century garb and stuff like that. And and Dr. David Silverman is now giving a, a, a course on on ancient Egypt on Coursera. So. You know, when I have like a quiet 15, 20 minutes during the day, I'll go plug into that. And it's just fascinating because 
you know, and it's, it's like, it's like being back there. So, so I do look back to these things. Yes. And I've made quilts. I mean, you know, so from my Egyptian tapestries, I made a full size, full size quilt for my son, a Colorado log cab. And I was, when he was two, I got into like quilting and things like that. So I've always, I always like to do something with my hands. And the drafting, well, the drafting that was like d designing materials and, 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 and getting into quilts and, and then doing this botanical art was sort of a segue. But my father was a mechanical designer. He worked for Skill Corporation, Motorola and Continental Can. And, and you know, he, I have a, plans for a mask that he designed to replace one that got that got hit by lightning. Anyway, so the creative spirit, uh, Robert Henry, who brought the Armory Show and the Impressionist and Modern Art to, to, the, uh, to the United States, was quoted as saying, art is the province of every human being. It's not a single separate thing. It's simply a, a matter of doing something, anything well. And the, then he talks in this book, The Art Spirit, about just finding what it is that excites you and just go do it. Don't let yourself get stuck. Don't, don't live in fear that you're not, it's not going to be perfect. It's okay. Just do it. Do what makes you happy. You know, and all, everything that we do in some way is art. There's art and poetry. There's art and cooking. There's art and gardening. It's all art. Sure. I mean, you know, I'm working on it. I'm trying. I'm like, you know what? I am going to get this down. I'm going to figure this out. <laughs> well, but remember. Well, I got that grandpa meter going. So I'm like, you know what? I love this tool. <laughs> well, right. But the thing about gardens is they're not static. You know, like with a painting, you know, you put the paint down there, it stays there. If I put a plant there, it's not necessarily going to stay there. It's going to sprawl. It's going to grow. It's going to do this or that. It's going to might die. It might take over my entire yard. So no, they don't. Plants don't. They're not static. So that's so the the challenge in designing a garden is to be able to predict the ultimate outcome of how the, these plants are going to be in any given season and what color they're going to bloom and yeah. It's always changing. Yep. 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 It is, and in natural areas too, I'm doing rare plant monitoring. These plants don't stay put either. I remember going after this one, this one species of orchids, um, and I was like, well, you were here last year. <laughs> Where are you? You're supposed to be, you're supposed to be like right here. You're supposed to be right here. Why are you not here? So then I sent out scouts in another area and Karen Lustig, who's a, a, a just retired from being botany and biology professor at Harvard College. And oh, Kathy, here they are. They're way over here now. Like, how did you get over there? No, well, or in orchid, the case of orchid seeds, orchid seeds are windblown. So they're the oh, smallest, okay. they're the smallest seeds on the planet. They're almost microscopic. The thing that's cool about orchid seeds is they have no, um, they have very little endosperm, which is the food source inside the seed. And so they, um, you've got seed cover and that's about it. So the, the analogy I always tell people is, is that, okay, if you have a, um, like my, my son has a Ford F-250 pickup truck and you've got the gas tank for that and that's a, like, the, like the amount of an asperminal lima bean, okay? And then you've got 
your like your 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 two your two cycle Harley, and it's uh, comparable to the amount of gas that would be in the carburetor of that. You know, to compare the amount of endosperm in an orchid to what's in a lima bean. And so the orchids have to have a relationship with a fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. And if the fungi, the proper fungi, and it's only one of like five different species of fungi that Dr. Melissa McCormick has, 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 has found out, so like one of just a few different species of fungi in the soil aren't there, that orchid's it's not going to sprout. But the, the th first thing is that the, either the fun, fungus is going to eat the seed or the seed's going to eat the fungus. So it consumes the fungus and then the fungi turn into like, like sort of an extended root system for the orchids. Hmm? That's a definitely, it is a symbiotic relationship. And so during the course of the, the plants growing up, it's taking um, it's taking trace elements from the the, the environment through the through the fungi, and then after the plant is 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 uh, is fully developed and photosynthesizing, then it's sending sugars and all kinds of things back out through that pathway. Anyway, we gotta go. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you so much.